So you've been an entrepreneurship lecturer at MIT for many years. Um, can entrepreneurship be taught? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, you know people say, well, you can't teach someone to play basketball, right? right? Well, maybe you can't teach them to be Michael Jordan, but you can teach people that have ability to do better. Yeah, it can absolutely be taught. Okay. Well, you've taught the popular seminar, the nuts and bolts of business plan, uh, since 1989. How has the curriculum of the seminar changed over the years? Has it undergone changes in terms of industry orientation or in terms of specific advice given to entrepreneurs on how to succeed, for example? Essentially, are there truths still hold true and what false truths have been disproved? Uh, gee, it's been a great course over the years um, and the only time where I thought maybe it, we had sort of lost it was in the internet bubble when you know I was sitting there saying, all right, somebody comes up with this idea of free internet mail and they sell it for $400 million in 12 months. And, you know, that just was totally off the model of anything. So at that point I thought, maybe I just don't get it anymore. Uh, but, you know, the course hasn't really changed very much. We were the first to bring entrepreneurs back on campus, uh, and including former students. Uh, and then when we got more uh, the business plan competition, we're trying to teach more specifically about business plans. We actually got somebody to reveal one of their plans, and we've been using that as a model. Uh, to, not because it's a good plan, but it's something to look at. The interesting thing about that course is that um, we bring in outside people. We tell them generally the area to talk about, but we don't tell them what to say. And people who take the course say, boy, it's, such, it's so integrated and everything ties together. And the reality is most of the speakers you know, in the first five years never met each other. In fact, after about five years, I said we ought to get together and you know compare notes. The thing that was really telling is that the, the consistency of the questions that have to be answered were there, regardless. So that the questions are really not that hard about um, you know what what you need to do to start a company or, or a business plan. The thing is, the answers are really difficult. Well, on the notion of advice, the entrepreneurship industry is inundated with advice and on what makes a great entrepreneur. Sometimes all that advice can be discouraging to aspiring entrepreneurs, yeah. for it makes them feel that you know they need to be somewhat superhuman to be successful. And this is particularly pain point for senior entrepreneurs, for we are still early in our development. Right. So the question is, do entrepreneurs really need to be su superhuman, or are there some skills that are really essential, and other skills that entrepreneurs can work on over time? Well, the problem is entrepreneurs, after the fact, always think of themselves as superhuman. <laughs> <laughs> and then until they've done it, until they've been out around a long time and they realize they're out there. You know, I think the most telling part of this was actually in Nuts and Bolts. Um, one year, we were into it at maybe six, seven years, and I brought back a student who had taken the course, and he had gone off and started a company, and you know, it had been a little bit of a success. And, and I said, just come back and, you know, you know tell them your story. That, that's, you know, nothing, you have 20 minutes or whatever. And so I introduced, you know, here's Bill or whatever. And we're in a big lecture hall, 10 to 50. Yeah. And he starts walking around the stage, and he starts walking up the steps, counting steps. He goes up about ten rows, and he counts over about seven seats in, and he points at the person sitting there and says, "You're in my seat, <laughs> huh? Get out of my seat." <laughs> what do you mean? You're in my seat. <laughs> well, <laughs> I sat there four years ago. And I listened to this class and I said, you know, I think I can do it. And you know what? You can do it too. Now I'm going to go tell you how I did it and how I screwed up in doing it and hopefully you'll learn something. And that was, you know, it wasn't scripted, at least on my part. <laughs> that was so powerful. The point is that role models, you know, that it, it's not superhuman. You know, these are people that put on their pants or skirts or whatever, like everyone else. And um, that's when you realize that you don't have to be superhuman to do it. Most of us think failure is terrible, right? You know, right. don't want to fail. Well, being an entrepreneur, you're going to fail. I mean, even Kleiner Perkins, who has probably the best record as a VC firm, only one out of every three investments they make turn out to be success. So that means they fail two out of three times. So, and that's even for the people that they select. So being an entrepreneur means you're probably going to fail more than two out of three times. Right. So, so you know, you're very connected to the startups coming out of MIT. Mm -hmm. What advice can you give, or, or what can you say about startups that succeed? You know, what makes them different from others? Well, if we're talking uh, student-oriented startups, the, the biggest thing I see, and we see it in the 100K competition over the years, is uh, the team 
we're not really good at forming teams and talking. Uh, so everybody joins around a project, all right? So I've got this new widget or this new idea, and the team comes together, and everyone works hard. But they all, no, but they really don't spend the time to sit down and say, what, am I, what, what, are, what are my goals? What do I want to get out of this? And so the first time you hit a, a big bump in the road, the team flies apart, um, or, or can fly apart if you're not careful. Um, and that's just a matter, it's partly experience. If you haven't been bruised a few times in business, the first time through can be hard. Um, and most of the time in school, you know, we come together around a project that might last a term. But if you're going to do a company, this is going to last a while. So we're not used to that longer term commitment where things start to bubble up. The related problem, especially when you bring technical entrepreneurs together with the business side people, and I draw this on a and nuts and bolts, um, it's probably hard to describe, but if you think about, especially for technology ventures, the, it's, if you look at the relative importance of the technologists versus the business people, and you do a graph over time, the, the technical person relative importance decreases over time. At the beginning it's high because if it doesn't work we don't have a business. And, and if you look at the business side at the beginning there's not a whole lot to do until you have something you can go out and show. So the relative importance of the business side goes up. So one's going down the other's going up. At the beginning when we're, we're pulling all nighters trying to get the technology working, you know, the technology guys are looking at the business guys saying, well geez, you know, what are these guys doing? I mean, I'm doing all the work, I should get all the rewards. And so there's this dysfunctionality that can occur there if you're not aware of this phenomenon and you haven't talked it out. And the business guys are saying, okay, when you're ready, I'll, I'll do something. And so especially if we're talking equity split in a venture, you know, you can get this very skewed behavior because over the long term, if you don't get both of those people working together, you won't have a success. So the biggest startup issues tend to be the people issues. Um, need to talk more about what the goals are, need to understand the dynamics of how a business evolves and be comfortable with them, or at least understand them, because otherwise, you know, people get bent out of shape and it can, it can blow up when it really shouldn't. So there's all this talk about Silicon Valley and the West Coast. Um, what makes Boston, you know, or the East Coast, a good geographical location for startups? Well, we've been talking about this for a number of years. Uh, I've sat at this very conference table. People come from all over the world uh, uh, to find out what, how, why MIT works the way it does, and they copy. Uh, every program, and then I, I see them five years later, and I say, how's it going? And they're not getting the same result. And, and the reason is, and it, you know, it took me a while to realize this, it's, it's not about the specific programs, it's about creating the environment. It's really, it's gotten a little trite these days, but it's the entrepreneurial ecosystem. This place evolves, new things come up, new ideas. It's just the whole environment in which uh, people uh, interact, where ideas can bubble up. It's, it's, that's the difference, and it's very similar on in Silicon Valley. I've been Finally, we'd like you to suggest one really big, exciting challenge that entrepreneurs should consider going after. The, the, the biggest challenge set that I see is the whole developmental social entrepreneurship thing. You know, we, uh, if we go back 20 years, we really, there were people that did entrepreneurial things, but there wasn't this sort of env whole environment around entrepreneurship. A few years ago, the they started the developmental track in the 100K, and boy, in a matter of two or three years, the quality of what was happening, uh, you know, what we saw in plans and the thinking about it, equaled, it took about 10 years of the 100K to get anywhere near that. And yet the problems are so much bigger. You know, if you look at the number of people in the world, we're going to be, what, 9 billion people in 2050 or something, it's not too far in the future, and, you know, what, a third of the population world doesn't have access to clean water and then that leads to all sorts of health stuff. And there's got to be better ways, of business models or ways of doing things um, that really bright people can think of. It doesn't have to be all technology based, it can be appropriate technology, but technology can make a big difference. You know, we saw, uh, what was it called, Donkey Net in the 100K? Uh, that was where, uh, you know, the, the rural postman in India would go village to village and they had a way to wirelessly communicate from a little kiosk where people could put email and it wasn't instantaneous but you know 24 hour turnaround wasn't too bad and it made a big difference there so I think uh, it's really find the biggest problems you can figure out how you can have a maximum impact and go out and, and try it because you know 
be low. If uh, regular ventures are not going to succeed you know, more than one out of three times, even in the best of circumstances, we got much bigger problems, much bigger impact, and I think the rewards are much bigger. So the, in the old days, you'd go make a bunch of money, uh, become Warren Buffett or Bill Gates, and then give it all away. And I'm not saying that isn't a good thing. It's just maybe some younger, smarter people could attack the problem right at the beginning instead of waiting.